What's happening, Discovery? How are you guys doing today? Doing good? Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Gained about 5, 10 pounds, you know? Hey, Amen. Wonderful. Hey, before I jump into this new series um, I'm really excited about, I want to talk to you about what was on your seats. You should have saw a card on your seats. Every year here at Discovery, we pass out these random acts of kindness cards, and we do this for the entire month of December. On one side of the card, it just says something extra to show you that God loves you. And on the back side, it just says, and so do we. And so here's what we want you to do all this month of December. And there's more cards for you to grab them in the lobby if you want more. But we want you to do random acts of kindness to people. And there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And on our website, we have some ideas if you want to go there. But some people like pay for the drive through person behind you, the Starbucks that, that, that and just leave a card here. Tell them, give them this card and it's on me. You can bless your coworkers with donuts. There's a lot of ideas you can do, and you just leave this card. You can, you can give a generous tip at a restaurant and just leave the card. Now, don't leave the card if you're going to be stingy, all right? Don't do that. You've got to be blessing them and then and put the card down, okay? But here it is. It might be random. Listen, it might be random for you, a random act of kindness, but please listen. It's not random for God. Okay, there's, there's what's called divine opportunities. And there are moments where, where you may be inspired. It may just feel like a thought to you. Oh, I should do something. Oh, I should pay for that. Oh, I should bless them. Oh, I could do something. And it may just feel like a random thought to you, but, but it could be exactly what that person needs. It could be the hope they need, the promise they need. It could be the blessing they need. Just to, just to know in this season, God remembers me. And we hear stories about this every year that just in the right time, that someone just did something as an act of kindness randomly, but it was at, at the right time for somebody else on the receiving end. So grab a handful and let's spread, spread the love of Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. We're, we're beginning today this series called Prophesy the Promise. Prophesy the Promise. And we're studying some of the promises that God has made in the scriptures that, that I believe are going to fill you like with hope. It's going to fill you with strength in your holiday season. Now, don't be afraid, though, of that word prophesy, all right? So don't be afraid of that. You don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. You just need to have faith in a future reality that is not yet. Amen. Are you hearing me okay? Every one of you can prophesy. And I'm not just talking about pulling just things out of the air and just going, I declare this or that. I'm talking about prophesying the word of God in your life, prophesying the promises of God. There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible that are waiting for your faith to meet them just waiting for your faith to declare some of the word of God into your life. Now, God's promises, they're like divine insurance policies. See, when you, when you know what's covered in your policy, in your insurance policy, when the circumstances happen, you don't stress about it, do you? Because you know it's covered. It's covered. But when you don't know what's covered or you're ignorant of what is covered, then, then you, you tend to stress out, don't you? When circumstances happen, you get all worried about it. Now check this out. This is why this, this series is so important for us. Your, your children, listen, your children will either inherit God's promises or your fear. Amen. Worry. Wor worry comes from the German word worgen, and it means to strangle or to choke. And that's what many of us live our lives. Choked. The life, the joy, the peace out of us. Worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and the power of God. So God, God makes two different kinds of, let me set this series up. God makes two different kinds of promises in the Bible. Unconditional and conditional. The unconditional promises, you are not, you or I, there's nothing that we can do that will stop God from fulfilling his word, his unconditional promises. The, the birth of Jesus was an unconditional promise. Emmanuel, God with us. We could, no one can stop that. Herod couldn't stop it. No one could stop the return of Jesus. His word says he will return for his church and rapture those who are his, that they may be where he is because he's prepared a place for us. You can't stop that. I can't stop that. No one, not the Antichrist, not the beast, not anybody can stop the return of Jesus Christ. That's an unconditional promise. Now, there are also conditional promises all throughout the scriptures. That, that they go like this. God says, when you do that, I'll be faithful to do this. If you, if you just believe, if you do this, then I'll be faithful to fulfill this in your life. See, these are the promises that I want to teach you. So, so God's promises teach us to trust him 
when it's difficult, when we're in difficult times. If there was never any difficult times in our life, there would be no need to trust in the promises of God. Let me show you some verses inside of your handout. You should have got a handout when you came in. Look up here on the screen. If not, it says, when I'm hurting, I find comfort in what? Your promise. They lead to life. That's where it gives us comfort. When we know the promises of God, when it feels uncomfortable, my circumstances, your promises bring comfort. Here's this next verse, Psalm 119, verse 114. You're my refuge and shield, and your promises are my only source of hope. See, when you think it's, it's hopeless and you, you feel like it's, it's all falling apart, that's when we hold to the promises of God. The more that you trust God's promises, church, listen to me, your life will be changed. The more that you can trust in God's promises, the more it'll change your life. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 1 says like this, hey, why does God give us all these great and marvelous promises? So that his nature would become part of us. Wow. So, so as I put my hope in that promise of God, in his word, as I trust in it, although my circumstances say this, and I let his word and his promises lead and guide my life, I'm actually taking on the nature of God as I walk out his promises in my life. Oh my goodness. That's why it's so important to understand, to know there is an epidemic. A lot of people don't know the promises of God, and they're there waiting for you to access those promises. So to kick off this series, I'm going to start today with, with prophesying the promise over your fear. Prophesying the promises of God over your fear. Fear, worry, anxiety, panic, and depression. They're like, it's an epidemic in our culture. That's why that song that we sang today, it said, fear can go to hell. Some of you freaked out when that, like, you're like, whoa. When I first heard that, I was like, wait a second here. I don't know if I can, if I can sing that, but listen, let me, let me help you out here. That kind of fear, anxiety, panic, worry, that didn't come from heaven. That came from hell. That came from, that came from the enemy. That is not part of God's plan for your life. That's why, that's why the song that we just sang said, fear can go back where it belongs. That belongs in hell. It doesn't belong in my mind. doesn't belong in my heart. Amen? Fear and worry and anxiety. These things, man, it's an epidemic in our culture. They're, they're developing new medical terms for new fears, like almost every day, it seems like, labeling you with names that God didn't put on you, telling you this is what you are, this is labeling you. That's not what God says you are. I mean, look at this medical term. One of the medical terms that, is, that I saw, sesquipedalophobia. I practice that a lot, you guys. Sesquipedalophobia, this is messed up, man. The fear of long words. Imagine the doctor office, right? You know what I'm saying? And the doctor's going, I'm sorry to tell you, but you got sesquipedalophobia. That's messed up. They're afraid of the long words. You're freaking them out. Just telling them what... Anyways. I need... So I'm telling you, these fears, that they, they, become, they become like giants in our life, taunting us. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. This is a promise that God gave to Joshua. He said, have I not what? God command. He didn't suggest this, okay? He didn't just say, hey, I think it would be a good idea for you not to be worried. I mean, a good idea not to be anxious. Hey, your life is going to be really better if you choose not to be. No, no, no. God said, hey, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. How can you say that, God? Like, I, How can I not be? How can I not be Afraid, that seems a little bit insensitive and unrealistic, God, because this world, you see this world, it's broken, it's ugly, it's hurtful, it's dangerous. How can I, how can I not be afraid for me or for my kids or for my future? How can I not be afraid? But you say commanding me not to be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. Listen, God is giving Joshua a secret to victory. Joshua was, was, was now the mantle of leadership after Moses passed away. He's going into the promised land where the spies, which Joshua was one of the spies in Numbers that went and looked at the land, and they said, man, they got giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers, and everyone's afraid. And God knows this. God knows what they're up against, and he says, look, those giants aren't your enemy. They're not your real enemy. The Hittites, the Midianites, the Canaanites, the Philistines, all the people that live in that land... That's not who you're really fighting against. Listen, this is the secret to victory. You're really fighting your fear. You're really fighting your discouragement. Because the only way the enemy can defeat you, can overcome you, is if you're overcome by fear. 
Because the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Are you hearing me today, church? This is a secret that God is giving Joshua here to his victory. Now, God isn't saying you can't feel fear. He's not telling you you can't feel fear. You can't feel discouragement. Listen, just because you feel it doesn't mean you have to be it. So, see, he's, it's okay. You, look, you're going to feel fear. You're going to feel. You're going to feel some discouragement. You're going to feel some fear. But God is saying, look, that's going to happen. I see those giants. You see them too. But don't let it become your identity. Don't, let, don't assume that thing. I was looking on Facebook here recently, and there was this, this person that said, in their, in their profile, descriptive of their profile, I'm a mother and a, and a servant of God, daughter of the king, and an anxiety sufferer. The enemy is a liar. I'm telling you right now, just because you feel it doesn't mean you have to be it. What we have to learn is how to process our feelings through our faith, not our fear. That's, that's what we need to do. Yeah, you're going to feel it, but what are you processing your feelings through? You got to process your feelings through your faith because, check this out, because what you fear the most reveals where you trust God the least. Ha <laughs> ha. What, what, do you, what do you fear? Look, I'm telling you, that those things that you fear, it may start out small, those things, but it can grow and become a giant in your life, taunting you. So let me, I put a little blank in your outline. Here, answer this question. Where are you not trusting God in your life? What's that area where you're afraid of the most, where you're not trusting God in your life? And maybe you don't even know that area yet, but as I, as I talk through this message and the Holy Spirit starts revealing some things to you, I've been praying for you this week that, that God will bring revelation to your heart to your life because we're going to slay some giants today some giants are going down the giants are going to fall today in jesus name you see it's important for us to name our fears because once you name them you can tame them and faith isn't ignoring the reality it's 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 recognizing that god's promises are greater than my current reality Let's take a look at, at an example from the Word of God today since we're talking about the giants. 1 Samuel chapter 17 tells the story of David and Goliath. And this amazing example of a story of our giants. Here's what it says. David said to Saul, who was king at that time, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine giant named Goliath. Your servant will go out and fight him, he says. Look, you're always going to have to face giants in your life. And the bigger destiny... You have, the bigger the giant you'll face. The bigger the destiny, the bigger the enemy you're going to have to face. David had a big destiny, so he was confronted by a big giant named Goliath. Goliath, if you, he's, Goliath is a nine foot six giant of muscle mass, okay? Full of his whole body armor, okay? We all have giants in our life. Some, some things we're going to come up against, some insurmountable circumstances, some severe hardships, some obstacles, some temptations. We're going to have some giants in our life. And it's not enough to just name your fear. It's not enough to just name your giant. Let me give you three steps today to slay the giant, and then I want to give you some prophecies so you can prophesy the promises of God over your fear. Write these down. Here's number one. After you name it, you got to face your giant. You got to face it. See, God never intended us to live with the giants. He always intended us to drive out the giants. Look, stop coping with it. Stop coping. Stop, Stop adjusting your life and making excuses for that area of your life. You've been adjusting to that fear, your life to it long enough. It's time to drive that thing out of your life. You've limited your life and what God can do through your life because of that giant of fear in your life. Some of you may not think you have a giant of fear in your life, or you may not know what, what it could be. Let me, let me ask you this question. I want to help kind of get, get to the beneath the surface here, okay? Where are you limiting your life? Or where are you limiting what God can do with your life? See, we have to face our limitations because your limitations will reveal your giants. All right, let me, let me show you some things, you guys. Some of your limitations may be driving. You don't like to drive at night. You don't like to drive long distance. You don't like to drive on the freeway. You don't like to drive down that road. And you say, I just don't like it. You don't like music when you're driving or you don't like people to talk to you when you're driving, things like that. Oh, I, just, I just don't like to be distracted. No, you have a giant in your life. Your limitation is driving, but you have a fear giant that's pulling the strings. You haven't processed that fear and that feeling through your faith. It's through your fear. Are you hearing me, you guys? 
okay? Some of you guys are, are, are afraid of, maybe, maybe you have a limitation of not seeing the doctor or the dentist. You say, oh, I don't like, I don't like going to the doctor. I don't like going, I don't like going to the dentist. Yeah, because you, you've got a giant taunting you in the distance. That's why. Some of your limitations, it may be shopping. You say, oh, I don't like big crowds. You don't like meeting new people. You don't want to go to a small group. And, 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 you, and you've, you've lived with that limitation. I'm just not going to meet new people. I'm not going to go around crowds. I'm not going to go to those small groups. I just don't do that thing. Yeah, you've limited your life because you really have a fear of being rejected. You have a fear of being accepted. There's a giant in your life. You're just living with the limitation. Some of you, you know that you need to continue your education to do the very thing that God called you to do. That you need to learn some things to do what God has called you to do. And you're not going to continue your education because you're living with that limitation because you think you're not good enough. That you're not smart enough. That you fear the failure that's coming from it. So that's the limitation, but there's a giant in the background taunting. Are you hearing me today, church? Some of you guys have unhealthy eating habits. Come on, I'm, I'm going there. Let's go. Some of you have unhealthy eating habits. You say, oh, I'm a foodie. Oh, I like food. I'm a foodie. Yeah. But you're eating your feelings. And the reason why you're eating so much is because you know there's something that you should do, but you're not doing it because you're afraid. It's easier to eat your feelings away than to have the difficult conversation you know you should have. It's easier to eat your feelings than handling that conflict that you know you should handle. Oh, come on, somebody. Are you, where are you limiting your life, because it reveals a giant taunting you in the distance. Some of you are, your, your limitation is depression. You go, I don't know why I'm so depressed. Look, depression is the expression, but fear is the reason. Where are we limiting our high? Look, this happens whenever you process your feelings through your fears instead of your faith. So when we're able to name the limitation, and some of you have made excuses with them. You've lived with them. You adjust your life to the limitations that the enemy has put on you. Instead of recognizing the limitation for what it is, there's a giant in the distance taunting you. And in every one of these limitations, the, 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 the you know, specialists they, with all these letters behind their name and stuff, much smarter than me, they say all these limitations, most of them come back to four big fears. Every limitation you put on yourself come back to, most of them, they say, four big fears. These aren't in your notes, but you may, re- may relate to some of these. One big fear is the fear of failure. That's really why I don't step out in faith. That's really why I don't try new things. I got to have, have perfect conditions before I really pull the trigger on things because I fear failure. I limit my life because of the fear of failure or the fear of rejection. That's why you don't meet new people. That's why you don't trust people. That's why you're not getting intimate in your relationships. That, that's why there's a limit in your life because you fear rejection or the fear of the unknown. I just don't know. I got to have all the details. Or here's the big one. They say most fears come back to this, the fear of dying. That's why you don't like spiders. That's why you don't like snakes. That's why you don't like flying. That's why you don't like driving. That's why you don't like the doctor. That's why all those things that, you, that you're limiting your life with comes back to, they say, the fear of of dying. Yeah, some of you have named it, but you've only named the limitation. You need to start facing the giant. Right. Woo, come on, somebody. Come on. Name it, name it, and then face the giant. And then the story continues. Let's pick it up there. Goliath looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome like your pastor. And he just... Disp- <laughs> what are you laughing? Just kidding. That's just my humor, you guys. Just, you guys will get used to it, okay? And he despised him. He said, "Woo, Okay. Uh, <laughs> he said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals taunting him, trying to make him afraid. But check this out. David said. David didn't let him keep talking. No, David interrupted his mouth and said, nah, uh, uh, uh. David said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name, in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then he starts prophesying and he says, and now this is what's going to happen. The Lord himself will deliver you into my hands. It ain't happened yet. Everybody thinks it's a ridiculous claim, but I'm telling you right now, The Lord is going to deliver you into my hands because God is faithful to his promises. You name it. You face it. Number number two, here's speak faith to your giant. Speak faith. Stop talking about your giant and start talking to your giant. Oh, see, the more you talk about it, the bigger that thing becomes. 
you were talking about it and talking about it. You're just magnifying it in your own mind. Stop talking about it and start talking to your giant. If you think you can defeat those giants of fear in your life without using your own voice, see, I've recognized that, that the big key I discovered is that my giants respond to my voice. See, look, your, your giants, you can't rely on my voice to beat your giants. Ah, see, 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 some of you need to start using your own voice to defeat your own giants. My giants respond to my voice. As I speak faith into my life, into my giants, they respond to my voice. Faith is the spiritual language of God. God responds to faith. I've learned that if you don't talk to your giants, your giants will talk to you. Some of you are letting them jabber on and on and on. You need to interrupt that giant. Start speaking the promises, speaking faith. That's why they try to silence you. Drown you out with noise and fear. Notice, too, that David didn't get in, in an insult competition. See, the giant tried to invoke fear in David. Tell him who he was and how he's not enough and he's, he's no way he's going to overcome and the odds are stacked against you. And the giant tried to instill fear in David. And David didn't, didn't turn insult for insult. He didn't say, look here, you big fat dummy. You ain't nothing but me. He didn't get into that. He said he, the only name he used was the name. Look, I don't need to call you. I don't, you call me whatever name you want. But all I got for you is the name of the Lord God Almighty. Amen, somebody? Amen. Speak faith to your giant. And then I love this. It says this. Here's the story continuing. As the giant Philistine Goliath moved closer to attack him. Check David out. David ran quickly toward the battle line. How many of you ever been in a fight before? You ever been in a fight before? It's like one of the worst things, the scariest things, is to be in a fight with someone who wants to be in a fight. You know what I mean? I'm sure Goliath didn't have this experience very often, nine foot six, you know what I mean? He steps to people. People usually step back. Listen, the enemy wants you on your heels. God wants you on your toes. That's God, wants you, God wants you on the offensive. God wants you on your toes, not your heels, church. you got to speak that faith toward, look, the, the whole army of Israel were 40 days in this valley, 40 days with this giant taunting them in the distance. Immobilize, look, fear will immobilize you. Fear will paralyze you. It'll stop you in your, in your tracks. The entire army, even King Saul, is paralyzed. They're coping with this giant. Here's what you need to do if you want to slay that giant. Here's the next thing. Run toward the battle line. Run toward the battle line. Um, you got to, you, they, they, don't let fear have a, air to breathe. You got to close the door to that thing. You give, you give yourself too much time and you're thinking about it in your head you start talking yourself out of it right. for as a man thinks in his heart so is he let me say it this way don't dwell on it deal with it Amen. come on somebody that's your word right there all right you're dwelling on it long enough you're letting that giant taunt you long enough in the distance scare you and intimidate you paralyze you you need to stop dwelling on what you know you should do and start dealing with it don't dwell on it deal with it check this out Goliath was not always a giant. He wasn't born nine foot six. Right. Amen, ladies. <laughs> he was a baby. Baby became a child. Child became a teenager. Teenager eventually became a man. J just, like, just like that, there's the, the giants in our life, they didn't start out giant. Right. They started out small, but we fed them with our fear. We fed them with our paralyzed, immobilized, allowing them to exist across the battle line, taunting us. They didn't start out as an, a full-on nine-foot-six giant. We just didn't deal with it long enough. We dwelt with it, and now we got a giant living in my land. Hey, it's, 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 time, to, it's time to charge the battle line. It's time to run towards the battle line. I'm telling you, you guys, fear is a liar. Come on, say that with me. Fear is a liar. Uh, it, it, you would think that the closer you get to the battle line, the closer you get to your giant, the bigger the object becomes. I'm telling you right now, it's the exact opposite with your fear. The closer you get to your fear, the more it is exposed for the illusion, for the lie of the enemy that it is. You'll see that that thing taunting you was a lie of the enemy all along. That I had the power. I had the authority. I had the name. I had the victory. Come on, somebody. It's time to slay some of these giants that we allowed to exist in the land. So as he's charging the giant, the story continues. 
reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Check this out. Without a sword. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Listen. What you think you need to defeat that giant is not what you really need. That, that what, they're, what they're telling you need, you need, what they're telling you, the solution. You can't use the world's solutions. You got, you got to use spiritual solutions for spiritual problems. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Look, if you can't use the weapons of this world, we have different weapons. The weapons we have are mighty, the Bible says, to the pulling down of strongholds, the lies of the enemy that hold us captive. We can demolish strong. You don't need what they say you need, what you think you need. I'm telling you, fear will make you forget that. Fear makes you forget. That's what the enemy wants. He wants you to forget what God has promised you. But look at this, 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. That didn't come from God. That's why we say fear can go to hell. That's where it belongs. It doesn't belong in my heart. It doesn't belong in my mind. God has not given me that spirit of fear. This is what he's given me. He's given me power. Amen. God has given me love. God has given me a sound mine everybody thinks david is crazy charging this giant everybody the philistine army is looking going look at this guy <laughs> all the other his brothers are going you're crazy you can't defeat him the entire army of israel thinks david is crazy but he is the sanest person on the battlefield he has processed his fears through his faith immediately see david understood that god isn't just a promise maker god is a prime a promise keeper he doesn't just make promises. God keeps his promises. So what are some of the promises of God that you can prophesy when you're afraid, when the enemy is standing, when, the, when your giant is standing across the battlefield yelling and taunting, and you feel it up your spine, the feeling of fear. You feel like you're going to be paralyzed. You feel like you're going to be immobilized. You feel like you, you don't want to move from here. What, what are some promises that you can prophesy in that moment over your fear. Write them down. Here are four things you need to prophesy. One, you got to prophesy. God promises he will never leave me. That's what the enemy wants to tell you in that moment, doesn't he? He's not there, but I promise you this. He's right there. He's right on the battlefield. He is standing. God is there. God repeatedly told Joshua this statement all throughout the scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, this is a similar to what we read earlier in Joshua chapter 1. Here in Deuteronomy 31, he says, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. That's repeated all throughout the Old Testament. You want to know why God repeats this? Because fear makes you forget. You don't, you don't, look, you may know this right now, but when you're on the battlefield and the giant's taunting you, fear will make you forget. That's why you got to prophesy it. That's why you got to declare it into existence. God, I know it feels like you're not here. I feel afraid and I feel discouraged, but I refuse to be afraid. I refuse to be discouraged. I'm going to declare your presence even though I don't feel it. God promises he will never leave me. When you're fearing a situation or an emotional challenge, when you're afraid, I want you to really envision this, church. Envision God saying this like directly to you. He's on your side. No matter who leaves you, others will leave you. Others will fake you. Others uh, will forsake you. Others will discourage you. Okay? God will never leave you. In those moments where you feel fear, God is whispering, I'm here. You'll be okay. I'm all you need, and I'm not going anywhere. Okay? So you prophesy that promise. God promises he will never leave me. Here's the second promise. When you're afraid, you prophesy. God promises to give me peace. God promises to give me peace. Now, everyone can have peace when everything is coming together. But God says, I want to give you a peace that stays when everything's falling apart. Amen. It's easy to have peace when the storm has subsided. But God says, I want to give you a peace that lives amidst the storm. Amen, Amen somebody? Amen. Isaiah chapter 54 says this. God promises, though the mountains may disappear. And he's saying that because he's saying like, it's going to happen. Listen, there's going to be some, th some things that disappear from your life. Th those resources will disappear. That job may disappear. That, that, those, that, your health may disappear. 
Your metabolism may disappear. Come on, somebody. It's going to happen. Life's going to happen, okay? So there's going to be some things that disappear, and, he, and the heels may come to an end. He's saying, look, because it's, it's going to happen. Some things will come to an end in your life. There's going to be some endings before you wanted them to be an ending. That some relationships are going to come to an end. Some, some careers or jobs or dreams are going to come to an end. You're going to have to bury some people in this life. Some things are going to disappear. Some things are going to end. But God promises, my love will never disappear. My, look at this, promise of peace will not come to an end, says the Lord. See, God promises a peace that stays, that sticks. And I admit that it's very tempting to try to equate God's peace to the calm we feel when circumstances are going good. Right? Because there is. There's a natural calm that happens when circumstances are going good. But that's not the peace that God offers here. That's not the peace at all. In fact, let me, let's do a little mental picture. Let me, let me give you a mental picture, and you tell me if your blood pressure starts to rise or if your blood pressure starts to go down and you start to feel a little bit better. Okay? Here, picture this. A 10-hour busy work day in the office. Blood pressure should be going up right now. Okay? Picture this now. A jacuzzi at just the right temperature. Dipping in that thing. Come on, somebody. Your blood pressure is going down right now. Now picture this. A birthday party for 27 three-year-olds. <laughs> Skyrocketing blood pressure right there, right? Okay? Okay, picture this. Picture this. A nice day at the beach. Ah, it's going back down. All right. Rush hour on the 99. Dang it. All right? How about a, a, a nice, clear, clean, breezy mountain lake? Oh, it's going back down, right? How about Black Friday shopping at doors open? <laughs> back up, right? Okay, so our circumstances do create a sense of calm in our life, but that is not the peace that God promises. Jesus said, the peace I give to you, the world cannot give. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that exists at the 10-hour workday. It's a peace that exists at that birthday party. It's a peace that exists during Black Friday, night, the rush hour on the 99. It's a peace that exists in every storm and every circumstance. Can I get an amen? That's a promise of God. You might not be accessing it, but it's a promise of God for you. Amen? God promised us this. It's his presence in the situation. That's what it is. That's the peace God brings, his presence into the situation. Here's the third promise we got to prophesy. God promises he will use this for my good. We've talked about this a lot in our last series, uh, in our grateful series, so I won't belabor it too much, but a lot of us make, because of fear, we make the wrong assumptions in our circumstances. We let fear consume us. We don't process it through our faith. We process it through our feelings, and we make the wrong assumptions. We think we've gone too far. We've made a big enough mistake, and we think, look, we got a lot of testimonies here, but I'm one of them. God specializes in making mis- in turning around mistakes. Amen, you guys? God can use this for my good. Romans chapter 8, 28. Let me read it to you again. Some of you guys know this. Here, it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to prophesy it. it, it to declare this when you're afraid, being taunted by your giant, to declare this truth into, to speak it. Not just to know it, but when you need it for it to come forth out faith. Amen? Here's what it says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Look, this is, I mean, this is God, this is like fail-proof, stress-free. I don't, God says, as long as I'm walking in faith, if I do something in faith and it succeeds, praise the Lord, it's a success. But if I do something in faith and it doesn't succeed and I fail, God says he'll use even that and turn it around for my good. I mean, this is fail-proof, you guys. This takes away even our fear of failure now. I can step out in faith and do great things because even if I don't reach it, God is going to turn it around for my good anyway. God's going to use this for my good. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the way the message translation says it. He says, look at all the ways in which your distress has goaded you close. We don't talk about goaded very much. That's an old word, but, but the shepherd would have an iron rod with a pokey and and he would goad the sheep eh, get back in line get you get, get get back over there and and so god says god says sometimes i'm gonna inflict some pain I'm, uh, sometimes i'm gonna make it a little bit uncomfortable for you sometimes it's, i'm gonna goad you closer to me 
And because of that, he says this. Look at this. Because of that, you're more alive. You're more concerned. You're more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Look at it from any angle. That hardship that you experience is, you've come out of this with purity of heart. And that's ultimately what God wants. God doesn't want your behavior modification. He wants a heart transformation. Okay? So we prophesy the promise that God can work even this. He can change it and work it for my good. Number four, God promises to love me unconditionally. That's a promise we need to declare because the enemy wants to lie to you and say, not only is he not here, but he's abandoned you, that he doesn't love you, that what you have done and how far you have gone and the mistakes that you've made has disqualified you from the presence, the power, the promises, and the love of God. That's a lie of the enemy. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says this, that this agape, unconditional love never stops. Say that with me. One, two, three. Love never stops. Love never stops. You, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how far you go. God will never stop loving you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. God is love. Unconditional, pure love. God, love never stops being patient, never stops believing. Love is always hopeful. Love never gives up. Love never fails. Amen. And really the key here to, to defeat this giant of fear, the key is love. John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, there is no fear in love. See, when I, when I know that God is with me, he's for me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. He's working for my good. He's establishing my future and my destiny, that I exist in the palm of his hand. When I, when I rest in that love, fear has no hold on me. There is no fear when I know God's unconditional love. But perfect love drives out fear. See, you were never meant to live with the giants. God wants you to drive out the giants. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of dying. That's the fear of punishment. The one who fears has not been made perfect in love. Let me give you this principle. God's principles always precede God's promises. God's principles Look, you, let, let me say it this way. You can't prophesy the, the promises of peace without practicing the principles of peace. Amen. Oh, I'm going to say that again, okay, you guys? I want you to see. You cannot prophesy the promises of peace without practicing the principles of peace. God says to focus your thought life, and he would establish peace. You, can't, you cannot practice that and think you can prophesy peace. God, are you, you can't prophesy peace when you're not even spending time with God in devotion or in prayer. You can't, prophesy. you can't prophesy peace in your life when you're not working for reconciliation and restoration and working out the conflict with people in your life. You can prophesy all you want, but unless you're practicing the principles. See, these are the conditional promises of God. They're yours if you walk with God. God says, hey, man, if you, if you just focus your thought life, if you, just, if you just, as far as it depends on you, you live at peace with those among you, I'm going I'm to establish you with peace. God's principles precede God's promises. Let me leave you with this promise, James chapter 1, this final promise. It says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Look, that, that person, he said, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Hey, we, it's okay to have doubts. It's okay. I doubt, you doubt. There's going to be doubts, but listen. Listen how you process your doubt. You have to process that feeling, that doubt through your faith, not your fear. Okay, how do you, it's okay to have doubts, just let your, we talked about this in our last series, let your doubts not drive you away from God, but bring you closer to God. Process them with God. It's okay to have the doubts, but if that doubt exists, I'm telling you, it'll, it'll take away the power of God and the promises of God from your life. Don't let your doubts drown out your faith. Look what it says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Some of you are tossed back and forth because you're letting your doubts drown out your faith instead of processing your doubts through your faith instead of your feelings. Can I pray for you today? We're going to slay some giants right now. Let me pray for you. Every head bow, every eye close. 